Hey all, we are going to spend some time now talking to uh, Dr. Valerie Irvin. She is a colleague that uh, I think I first met you actually, it might have been at a uh, educational technology conference, I believe walking somewhere in Honolulu, if I remember correctly. I can't recall, I think it might have been Ed Media, but either way, uh, Valerie's done a lot of work in areas that many of you are facing now. And her uh, research in this space, as well as sort of helping develop uh, doctoral students and so on, I think is quite significant and quite relevant. And one of the things that we want to do specifically with this course is to really differentiate that, yes, there are name, a number of practices that you can engage in when you're teaching online, but there's also a rich research base that you can start to develop and build into your coursework. So Valerie, why don't we start with just a quick introduction? You know, what do you do? What's your role? I do. Um, so I'm a, I'm a faculty member in educational technology at uh, the University of Victoria. I'm co-director of the Thai Lab, which is technology integration and evaluation research lab. Um, I, I teach in a teacher, teacher ed undergrad program um, and I teach graduate courses in educational technology um, and supervise uh, master's and PhD students in the area as well. Um, I've, I've I teach face-to-face -face more in a blended way in a multi-axis merge mode way and I've taught online and and open um, uh, running early open courses since 1998 so uh, kind of that's my spectrum great and, and your research particularly with Thai lab which is uh, something I've seen you you work on for I, I'm guessing you must be close to a decade if not more already that you've been doing work and I remember early on you were addressing the idea of having people both locally present but then also communicating and doing the teaching online and in this case your many teachers aren't going to quite have that luxury of a local student population with the dual online end but it must have given you a lot of insights through your research around what are the experience of people, especially in a distance setting. Do you, could you talk a little bit about your research, what you've looked at and what you've learned? Yeah, um, well, one thing I find, I know people have modality bias. So I, I think part of it's just getting over that, uh, the perceptions that they have of, of what learning looks like um, in an online space. I also know that our research is highly contextualized. Uh, there isn't gonna be a one size fits all. You'll hear people saying like, um, you know, people are saying synchronous and no, it shouldn't be synchronous or others are saying it should be only asynchronous. Uh, honestly, it, 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 there, isn't, there isn't gonna be a one size fits all. The research is contextualized. So um, it, it's going to be exploring what fits someone's context. Um, there has been a prevalence of thinking that online equals passive or um, not engaged in those types of things. That's that's a misunderstanding. It can exist, but it also can exist in face-to-face -face environments as well. So it's understanding and letting go of a lot of the biases and 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 that are not their assumptions that we need to move past. Um, and and reaching out and trying to find if you are searching in research search for your context specifically if it's graduate classes there's lots that are specific to that context if it's rural versus urban or like it find the stuff that's contextualized there is not going to be a one size fits all and read read into findings um, whether it applies to your context or not um, yeah yeah, the context one is critical. Obviously, your students are going to be different. Yeah, let's say if you're teaching a graduate course in chemistry versus a first year undergraduate course in psychology. Let's say you have uh, you're in an R1 institution in the US, which for those international participants typically refers to, for lack of a better word, as a research intensive university you're going to have access to a different set of resources than if you're a smaller state college or if you're a smaller uh, college in, in Canada or in Norway and, and areas like that. So there is really a lot of consideration that faculty need to give to the context of themselves, their students and their technology infrastructure. Sometimes you may not even have access to Zoom or you may not have video conferencing. Uh, resources in general. You may end up using uh, free tool sets like something Google or Skype or whatever else that's that's available as an option. So and I think that's a critical point. So I'm glad you raised the context question that everything is going to be shaped by what you have available for tool sets and I would hope careful attention to how your students respond as you begin. Like don't think you need to plan everything out, run and deploy, 
and then not make any corrections. I think take small steps, make a few initiatives, see what happens, adjust, and the list goes on. Uh, so you, you've been doing this for a long time, basically your entire career that you've been deeply involved in the ed tech space. What kind of advice would you have? You've got a new faculty member just starting to go online. What should she be thinking about? Uh, take care of yourself. Um, teaching face-to-face -face is not going to be perfect from the first time you try it. The same thing, it's not going to be perfect the first time you try it online. So be easy on yourself. Um, what I, I what I recommend is, is ways to support the learners as human beings and not seeing them as numbers. Um, so when we talk about, I mean, how I like to approach it when I teach online, I, I often tend to do one hour of synchronous per week, and that's max. So the course is usually three hours. I don't use full three hours synchronously. Um, again, if synchronous fits your bill, because it depends on bandwidth, it depends on technology at, at home and all that. Um, and I really support learning pods, and I found that has gone over really well with a variety of different contexts where um, in the other times, I expect them to meet in groups of four and support reading each other's work. I, I like using blogs by learners, but you're going to have to be careful. You have to consider FIPA, which is our privacy law in BC, and whatever your context is, how you're allowed to proceed with those things. Again, this is where context matters. Connect with your university staff. Um, connect with your, and if you are leading something, connect your faculty, connect your educators while they're trying to shift so they can share their trials and tribulations. Um, um, and don't mark everything. I think one thing I might be worried about is people assigning a bunch of blog posts and then um, marking them all. It, it, for a class of, I think, 25, it took me about seven hours to mark a blog post across 25 students. So count, be careful <laughs> um, and don't assign more. A lot of people will think that oh, it's online and now we don't have synchronous time together in a class, I'll assign all this other stuff. Stop it. it, it just moving online, people are going to be developing their digital literacies and those types of things. So um, don't increase the workload. Uh, and also that means for yourself, you, you could easily drown yourself in the interactions that you may be supporting as well as um, the marking. Um, so don't mark everything. I ask my learners to to blog regularly because reflective practice is really a valuable approach to learning and blogging is great for that. Um, they have to decide things like, are they gonna be online at all? Which I do believe that's a choice. I support learner choice uh, and agency in what they do. Are they gonna be using their name? Are they gonna be using a pseudonym? Um, are they gonna be public? Are they gonna be private and only you have access or the class? So all those different ways. Um, uh, and but I do use a WordPress blog for my teaching and I use FeedZ to aggregate as a plugin to to aggregate learner blogs, but the learning pods, they can at least share their learning with each other. So think of your context and I give them all, um, I mean, we have a Zoom link today, but I provide many links as breakout rooms. I get like 12 links and I share them out. I post them, not publicly, <laughs> or you don't know who's gonna come and join you, but um, to, to let them actually on demand, hey, let's meet or have a, a specific time that that small pod meets. And that I think is something that will support them in having a community, support them in their learning, um, and to be responsible for that peer assessment of each other's work. Um, and, and think about assessment differently. Um, I, I do have a measurement background at the graduate level um, and um, grades uh, assessments made by uh, teachers have a 0 0.4 reliability, which means it's not reliable. <laughs> we, we try putting this A, B, C, D or whatever percentage is the best, you know, we can feel good about ourselves on that, um, but it, it doesn't hold the, the the learning science does not support it that when instructors make their own assessments, it's not reliable. So give yourself a break on that. Um, do you actually have to assign marks to everything? Um, some things I just say it's a requirement they need to complete it in order to complete the course. And then here are the other assignments or it's a, it's a component. Um, and I do assessment interviews uh, in past grade courses and I also do assessment interviews in graded courses. Again, I'm not doing 200 student classes though, so <laughs> it's a bit different. But to think about how you can shift some of those ways to build connection, it's more rewarding. Oh my gosh, it's so much more rewarding to meet with a learner one-on-one -on -one in a video room, or I, when I was teaching face-to-face, -face, they would come into my class, 
we would go over and I'd give them 10 minute slots to show me their learning, to discuss it. I would tell them, you know, what I, I, my thoughts are. I asked them to give me their self-assessment of a grade. And I said, well, this is what I thought was, would be your grade. And we then talk about it. Um, almost every single time they underestimate their grade. Um, only one time one person actually gave a higher grade and, um, and actually I reflected on it and I, and I, I reflected on my biases too. And I thought, no, he, he was right. So um, those are some of the tips I think I would give for getting things going and protecting your, your time, protecting their time and supporting community and good practice. Oh, great, great points. And one of the things that you brought up, and so the final question uh, I'll direct to you here, but one of the important things you brought up was just the range of technology that's available. So yeah. you, could you talk a little bit about the relationship between institutionally provided technologies that you use in learning practices versus the, the big old hairy open web? Yeah, so um, when it comes to institutional, um, our, our institution has a shared provincial site license to BlueJeans. So we don't use Zoom, but um, Zoom is another option. Again, check your context because I think they went through a privacy impact assessment for using BlueJeans, right? That wasn't with using Zoom. So check what you have available institutionally. Um, check your permission and privacy laws. But um, I don't use an LMS. I haven't used one, I mean, I, was, I started teaching open and online before Murray Goldberg, you know, created um, WebCT back then. I came back many years later to try it out, see if anything changed. It didn't. I see the LMS as a lecture podium in an online environment. So, you know, it, it, it's, it's very content oriented. It reminds me of like if you went to a bank teller and you had like the, the glass wall in between and someone passes the assignment through and they pass it back it, it it's it's preventing in my opinion the the community building um also it cuts off your community at the end of the course when they shut it down so i, I do like and but i don't necessarily recommend that people jump to the practice i'm doing because i've been doing it a very long time but i do use um uh the blue jeans video um tools Outside of that, I, I use Trello um, for project management planning. Um, the students can use it just on their own to, and you can actually see who's marking what tasks done. So you can see, you know, who's doing most of the tasks if you need to. Um, and I, it, it's great for supporting inquiry um, where you can pop in and add tasks. Um, Hypothesis is a wonderful ethical ed tech for, um, uh, I use it to mark blog posts, um, but I make it a private group of one-on-one -on -one of me with each learner, um, and I make a group, um, uh, private private group for our entire class to look at a reading. Um, but again, those are a little bit different. It, you're going to have to judge, you know, people are going to have to judge their own dig digital literacy level. Um, and if you are going into an LMS and that's safe and it's good right now, and it yes, it might be um, not ideal for gathering and building a community. Um, I'm not a fan of it, but if it's your first step, go for it and just iterate, iterate bit by bit. Um, start exploring maybe just blue jeans with an LMS and try and expand over time. But um, whatever you do, don't try everything all at once um, and start where you have someone holding your hand and find people in your community to hold your hand too. So. Yeah, those are great, great points. And uh, the expertise, personal comfort matters. They, they're, this might not be the best time to do a deep existential evaluation of teaching practices as you move online. I think this semester, it's whatever gets it done. If that is an email list with your students, or if that's blue jeans, or, yes. or you know, have at her. If it's Blackboard, Desire to Learn, or WebC, well, no longer WebCT, but Canvas. But then there will be a window coming up because this is not a short-term trend. This, you're, you're going to, I, I do not expect we'll be back to all hands on deck in September, which means, and even if we are, there, there will be a growing range of technologies being used in classrooms because students and faculty have experienced them. So this is the get the job done short-term. You're going to have a window after the semester wraps up in a, you know three, four weeks time, five weeks time, depending on which part of the world you're in. Some of you say in, Australia, uh, for example, are really just the start of the semester. So whatever you're up against, get the job done now 
Uh, but you'll have a window for more thoughtful, focused evaluation. And they have an opportunity to bring in guests globally. Yeah. I mean, that is so rich. Um, you can design a reading, bring in the author of that reading. And we do that all the time. And it's, it's, it's a beautiful, it's, there are so many opportunities that come. And I never teach the same way twice. Um, you know, I, I've also introduced Slack as another tool, but Mattermost is an open version of it. I need to learn how to switch to that. Once you start teaching with technology more, you're never, it's, it's actually quite fun and dynamic to keep yeah. finding yeah. the new gold nuggets that you get to, yeah, appreciate. And ditch the ones when you pick up a piece of coal, it's okay, put it down and, and move on. Yeah, that, that's a fantastic note on which to end because the biggest thing I've found with participating online is that it is literally about participation. It's about you learning with a network and your students, as you shift online, are going to find voices other than you. In a classroom, you may be the central dominant node. Online, you'll still be a critical node, but they're going to have other nodes. They're going to watch guests you know, the, the people that they read about in the, in the textbook that week or in the OER resources they reviewed that week, they're gonna watch her presentation on YouTube because she recently had a talk at a conference last, uh, last year or something that's relevant. So I think that's a critical thing to emphasize is that the space enables new approaches over time and it really enables one where you participate and learn with your peers. It's not only an instructional space for, for your students, like for you to talk to your students, it's a co-learning space for everyone. Valerie, a real pleasure to connect with you again. Thanks for your insight. We'll look forward to putting your resources and readings up for participants in the course to engage in. Thanks again. Thank you. Thanks.